Hello everyone! The first third of this video is a remake of an episode I put out in 2020, right before the release of Paper Mario The Origami King. It was entitled, Paper Mario's Fandom Explained with a Broken Family Analogy. I rewrote and re-recorded that segment, then added a bunch of new stuff afterward justifying it all, particularly why Super Paper Mario is part of what I call the original trilogy. I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> this franchise, Paper Mario, has had its fanbase torn for a long time now. Mainly by, well, that pun I just made, torn. That's because these three newer games put far more emphasis on paper-related gimmicks, taking place in an actual world of paper, instead of just one with a storybook quality. Paper gimmicks do absolutely exist in the originals, but they're subtle and not a central focus of the plot. Since there is now such a divide between these now six main games, I propose we unofficially split the two trilogies apart, calling these first three games the Mario Storybook Trilogy, and the recent three the Mario Pop-Up Book Trilogy, aka literal Paper Mario. This can't be officially recognized as, like Star Wars, which also has one trilogy much more beloved than the others. All of these games will forever share the same title, but can we as fans agree to treat them as two separate entities moving forward? It's a dissonance in the past decade between what the creators have been putting out and what the longtime players want, which has only just now started a change with the Thousand Year Door remake. With that said, I'm not personally trying to make a statement about how this is the good half and this is the bad one. I myself love five of these six games. No, the goal of this video is to provide an easy to understand, albeit strange, analogy of how we got here, what this division means, and how we can use it to grow as a fandom. Okay. Let's say that the first three Paper Mario games are people, and that they all live together in a single household. The N64 version is the eldest, a respectable type with a good head on his shoulders. The Thousand Year Door, then, is the middle child. He's cooler, smarter, and edgier than his older brother, but the two get along exceptionally. They hardly ever fight and are inseparable, bunking in the same bedroom. Their friends even say it's hard to get along with one of the two, but not the other. That brings us to the third child, Super Paper Mario. He's the quirky youngest who is alike in many ways, but also has plenty of different ideas. He's individualistic, sleeping in a separate room, but the siblings all live under the same roof and get along for the most part. It's easy to see then that these three are all cut from the same cloth. Intelligent systems, aka their parents, consist of the dad, a great scriptwriter, but whose publisher began pushing for a sterilization of the characters from his works. Then there's the mother, who, work with me here, is a renowned MMA fighter who retired after the birth of her second son. The parents have been having marital problems for a while though, and so the father decided to move far away, where he wound up starting a new family, coincidentally having another set of three kids with a different woman. Those kids are Sticker Star, Color Splash, and the Origami King. These three younger siblings are all creative types, using arts and crafts to tell stories, mostly inspired by the adventures of their estranged half-brothers they sometimes hear about. These children all have the same father, but live in entirely different households. His new wife is the opposite of his ex, a bit anti-combat. Furthermore, these children are much younger and inexperienced in the quote-unquote battles of the real world. Unlike their half-brothers too, beloved by most who meet them, these kids are bullied because they can never live up to expectations. But then what happens? Well, like an awful sitcom, imagine that all six children are grown. They end up meeting and decide to room together in the same apartment. Turns out that was a terrible idea, because they constantly fight and the outside of the building is always being decorated with flowers by swarms of fans who praise the Mario Story trilogy, and egged from the literal Paper Mario's reception at the same time. Do you see what I'm getting at? This family may have one parent in common, all sharing their dad's name, but they lead very different lives. They should probably at least see each other for Thanksgiving, but they don't have to live together because it isn't harmonious. So let's board up the Mario Story crew and the literal Paper Mario gang in their own homes. Do you like these set of games? Then imagine putting them up in a comfortable vacation home somewhere. Do you despise them instead? Envision them in a crummy shack you can pelt rocks at. Wait. Paper beats rock, so scissors. Regardless, my point is that we should not chastise fans who go to visit one or the other simply because of their varied interests. It seems like the father and his ex are starting to get along again, and have come to an agreement to give TTYD the spotlight once more. 
but whether the hypothetical next set of games will be with a different partner remains to be seen. Alright, the analogy is getting a little weird. With that said, I want to now dive a bit deeper into what I just talked about and make a few points very clear. To address the elephant, or muff, in the room, yes, Super Paper Mario is technically the game that started seriously messing with the formula. It stripped the combat the original established and the sequel perfected, pushing away the tried-and-true turn-based battle system in favor of action platforming infused with RPG elements. Some did not like it. However, as I made clear at the beginning of this video, this split isn't about personal preference. You may not vibe with the change, but I still think Super Paper Mario belongs on this side because in every other way besides the fighting, it feels like a sequel to TTYD, using the original as a base to work from, whereas the Origami King feels like a sequel to Color Splash using Sticker Star as its base. The two trilogies follow their own continuities. The first three games have recurring characters created uniquely for Paper Mario. There's Merlin and the many wizards of his tribe, the endangered species Wacka, and a great number of returning enemy types. Clefts disguise themselves as rocks and have a high defense. Rough Puffs are electrically charged clouds. Koopa Trolls are armored Koopas. And Crazy Daisies, with a rare Amazy Daisy counterpart, puts its foes to sleep with a lullaby and possesses the tendency to flee from encounters. Then there's redesigns of classic Mario enemies seen with clubbas, variants of spikes wielding spiked clubs, say that three times fast, Gloombas as blue-skinned underground Goombas, and Frost Piranhas as a frozen counterpart to the standard killer plant. Like the Paper Mario exclusive Dugans reappearing in the Thousand Year Door 2, many species introduced in TTYD make a return for Super, but never again in the franchise. Spanias, Dullbones, Dark Boos, Poison Pokies, and Putrid Piranhas. It's the Pokemon wrap of enemies exclusive to the original trilogy. While the newer games do call back to this occasionally, it was a quirk of Paper Mario to have all or most enemy Koopa Troopas wearing sunglasses. In fact, stylized designs for essentially every common enemy was once a staple of Paper Mario. Dry bones, boos, pokies, and even goombas used to all look a little different. Starting with Sticker Star though, they were all sanitized, visually updated so as to not deviate from the main Super Mario series aesthetic. This generalization was actually addressed directly by the producer, Kensuke Tanabe, in an interview with the Video Games Chronicle. According to Tanabe, from Sticker Star to the Origami King, it has no longer been possible for the designers to modify Mario characters or to create original characters that touch on the Mario universe. The specificity of this decree from corporate higher-ups is a little confusing, but from the rest of the interview it seems that new NPC races and creatures that try and fit into the world of Mario, like TTYD's Punies and Super's Nimbies, are not allowed. I can't even imagine a species like the Shroobs from Mario and Luigi Partners in Time getting the okay nowadays, because even though they're aliens, they can be seen as clear modifications of Super Mushrooms or Toads. Do keep in mind that exactly what is and what is not permitted is speculative, with again the TTYD remake now muddying this statement, but it helps explain why, in the first three games, there were all sorts of wild and varied NPC races that coexisted in the Mario universe, while members of the traditional Mario cast themselves were accentuated with differentiating features, e.g. Toads and Goombas sporting locks of hair, but not in the newer trilogy. Apparently, costumes are allowed as long as they don't change the character's biology, but even then they've been used very sparingly. I think the team has done the best that they could given these absurd limitations, and some good may have actually resulted in this restriction, like the Origami King's tragic plotline involving factory bob not surviving their own explosions. It is sad knowing that a port full of sailor bob with helms on their backs instead of wind-up keys can apparently no longer exist in tandem with these standard versions. Unless it's a remake of a title that already had them, that is. I am so relieved to see that the Thousand Year Door remake is surprisingly incredibly faithful to the original in that regard. Unlike the 3DS versions of Mario and Luigi, Superstar Saga, and Bowser's Inside Story. Just the fact that the OG art design is respected and the rules have seemingly been lifted with this game makes me hopeful that if this Switch release sells especially well, these lame limitations will loosen up. That was a bit of a tangent, but just know for the purpose of this discussion that since 2012, new and original Paper Mario characters have objectively been cut down considerably, which affected Sticker Star, Color Splash, and the Origami King. The aforementioned Merlin, 
a wizard crucial to the first and third game's plot, while offering plenty of assistance in the second, was completely scrapped, along with his many ancestors. Wacka, a brick joke of a character producing delicious and nutritious bumps whenever it's hit, must have truly gone extinct in Super, because the species is never explored in Paper Mario again. Instead, Birdo appears as a recurring character in the latter trilogy who has a thing for Mario and repeatedly references getting egg on the face of her supposed lover. Another character archetype the more modern games use is the sacrificial partner. Curtsy, Huey, and Olivia are all unique entities related to the given arts and crafts theme, who serve as the only permanent party member to accompany Mario for the entirety of their respective adventure. While Super's pixels were a bit more generic and used as tools more than actual characters reacted to what's happening in the story, they're permanent party members giving utility on the field, which is something the Origami King finally tapped back into, although not exactly. The Toad Professor is the only truly helpful ally outside of battles, and he doesn't leave the desert with you. The original trilogy has an intricate recipe system too, involving chef characters that cook things up using ingredients you bring them. Electro Pops, Koopa Tea, Shroom Cake, Shroom Steak, and Spicy Soup are just some dishes that are seen across all three games, while others like the Couple's Cake and Snow Bunnies appear exclusively in TTYD and Super replenishing and offensive items that span the original two like dried, super, ultra, and life shrooms, egg bombs slash missiles, syrup, tonics, and many, many more return in super. Compare this to the worn out jumps, e-cammers, and line jumps, all recurring items between sticker star and color splash. Then there's the shiny, flashy, and iron boot attacks that appear in all three of these other games. You may be thinking, but what about the surprise quiz shows that appear in each entry? There's the photographs of Princess Peach depicting her Paper Mario evolution and design from the Origami King, and these letters written by classic partner characters Paracarry and Goombella, found, uh, in the garbage of Sticker Star. I think of it like this. Yes, there may be a through line connecting all six games, but the threads that hold them together are much tighter with the separate trilogies. As a whole, it all kind of loosely fits with light cameos and callbacks. For example, Sticker Star mentions that pair of older partner characters by name, while the Thousand Year Door actually brings back a couple with Paracarry and Bo appearing in the flesh. Boos don't have flesh, but you know what I mean. The small references in the newer games remind us that this set is all still part of the same franchise, but they're so few and far between that it just feels like we're being thrown a piece of a bone. Ultimately, these three games have much more in common with each other than these three, and vice versa. I could go on and on with obvious examples like filling in spots on the map with confetti and paint being analogous, but I think I've said enough to get the point across. Despite Super Paper Mario's differences, there are so many of these returning elements that respect the original's continuity. It continues the legacy and world building that these games established by bringing back assets and ideas distinctive to its world. Super was the first game to make a strong departure from the Paper Mario formula, but besides its lack of the same battle system, this adventure certainly has the spirit of the first two. So there you go. That is why I think Super belongs with the first two games, while this set is its own thing. If we can all agree on that, I want first fans to try and start getting along better. Things are really looking up for fans of the older style of games, though if someone's first Paper Mario was the Origami King, for example, and really loved it, but just isn't a fan of TTYD, can we accept that and play nice? I'm not saying there isn't room for discussion, comparisons, and debate because that's all still fascinating and needed, nor am I suggesting that you can't praise one side while criticizing the other, but despite my understanding of why things got so heated, I do want this chapter of everyone fighting about what Paper Mario is to simmer down a bit. I encourage you to petition for the developers to continue this revival of the original style. It's what I want after all, but let's not berate others for enjoying things we don't. Let us coexist in peace separately, but like one big messed up family, we can still visit each other on occasion. Thank you.